Hello. Back in the late 80s, a fairly short-lived new computer magazine appeared called ST Amiga Format. And, like a lot of magazines, it came with a cover disc. But this was no ordinary disc, it's a dual format disc created by Rob Northern Computing. And somehow, it contains completely different content for both the Amiga and the Atari ST systems on the same disc at the same time. Only the Amiga could see the Amiga content, and only the Atari ST could see the ST content. So how did they do that? Well, in this video, I'll show you how. I think the best place to start is to discuss the differences between the Amiga and the Atari ST's floppy drive, as the differences are quite important. The Amiga arrived on the scene ever so slightly later than the Atari ST, sporting a double density, double sided floppy disk drive. However, the same can't be said for the Atari ST. Now, I'm absolutely not an expert on the ST, so here's Reese from Control Art Reese to explain that a whole lot better than I can. Thanks, Rob. That's right, I am indeed one of the world's leading experts on Atari ST floppy drives. Or at least the only one that was available at such short notice. Yeah, sorry about that, but either way, I am more than happy to help you out with your floppy drive conundrum. So, way back in 1985, Atari released this, the 520 ST, the original Atari ST model. And if we take a closer look at this, You'll no doubt notice that the back part of the case is actually quite a bit shallower than we're used to seeing in later ST models. And the reason for that, of course, is because this didn't have an internal floppy drive. So they released it with an external drive called the SF354. This was a single-sided, double-density 3.5-inch drive with a capacity of 360K. A year later, Atari decided it was about time they got on board with this whole double-sided bandwagon. And so they released a double-sided version of this drive called the SF314, alongside the very first ST with an internal floppy drive, which was called the STF. And indeed, that deeper case design went on to be the design that they used in the STFM, which is probably the best known model, and the STE. The reason for all of these single drive shenanigans should be quite obvious to anyone who knows their Atari history. This is Jack Trammell we're talking about. He wanted to keep the headline price of the ST as low as possible to make it much more attractive compared to, say, the Mac and the PC at the time. And that's why he went for the much cheaper single-sided drive and kind of snuck the double-sided drive in a little bit later on uh, due to consumer demand. Trouble is, because there were so many single-sided drives out there and so many software houses that were set up for publishing ST games and software on single-sided discs, that the single-sided disc actually became quite long-lived in the world of the Atari ST. Certainly longer than a lot of the other platforms that were around at the time that had moved on to double-sided discs. And indeed, you know, there were plenty of sort of cheaper single-sided floppies available for those publishers to use for their ST software. And so that's why it's quite important for Atari ST emulators and the like to support single-sided floppy drives. So hopefully that answers that query. Uh, thank you ever so much for having me on, and back to Rob in the studio. Thanks, Reese. That was really informative and really interesting. And if you haven't seen Reese's channel, make sure you check it out, and links are in the video description. Now, I'm sure some of you have instantly jumped to the conclusion about how these dual format discs worked, with the ST using one side in the traditional single-sided mode, and the Amiga using the other. Well. There's some truth to that, but there's a lot more going on, because that alone wouldn't have worked. So, let's take a closer look. The Atari ST portion of this disc uses the FAT12 file system, and for that file system to even be read, he needs to be able to read from the first few sectors, from track 0, on the lower side of the disc. The lower side being the first side. This contains information on the actual layout of the disc, for example, the number of sectors and the total number of tracks. It also contains the first sector of the FAT or file allocation table. So good so far. However, the Amiga file system, regardless of whether it's an OFS or FFS system, also needs to read the first few sectors from track 0. The first sector usually starts with the three letters DOS or DOS, followed by a single byte that identifies the type of file system in use. So how can both file systems exist on the same disk at the same time when they both require the same sectors? Well, let's take a closer look at one of those disks. This is ST Amiga format disk number 5, and there's some very interesting things going on straight away. First, looking at the right hand side, that's the upper side, as suspected, 
This is all Amiga data in standard Amiga format. The lower side, however, looks like a PC disc, but with a few strange things going on, aside from it having 10 sectors per track instead of the standard 9. Look here at the first track, and this one here, which I believe will be track 40. Let's have a look at track 40. Well, track 40 contains the root block used by the OFS or FFS file system, and it looks like here like the entire track has been written with all Amiga sectors. So the Amiga gets exclusive use of the upper side of the disc and track 40 on the lower side. The ST, however, treats this disc as a single-sided disc and uses most of the lower side, except track 40. However, they both share track 0. So there's two questions here. First, how is track 0 shared between both systems? And secondly, how were files added so they didn't write over the tracks and sectors used by the other system? Well, let's start with track 0. This is track 0, represented using the HXC floppy disk emulator software. And there's some normal FAT12 sectors here, in fact, these are sectors 2 to 10. But you may have noticed they're a little bit thinner than you would have expected. Well, unlike the rest of the disk, where the sectors are 512 bytes in size, these sectors are actually 256 bytes in size. How is that possible? Well, this is allowed because the header before each sector actually indicates information about the size of the sector data following it. So where's sector 1, the first sector? Well, it's actually here, right in the middle of the Amiga sectors. Those sectors are Amiga sectors 0 and 1, which are the reserved two sectors at the start of the disk I mentioned before. But how can one sector exist inside another? Well, there's two different tricks at play here, and we'll start by looking inside those two Amiga sectors. And I know this looks a little bit crazy. This is Amiga Sector 0, and this is Sector number 1. These are always reserved at the start of a standard Amiga floppy disk. Remember how I said it started with the word DOS? And the next byte, in yellow, identifies the file system. In this case, 0 means it's an OFS disk. The next four bytes are actually a checksum to make sure the boot sectors are intact and haven't been modified. The four bytes after that are reserved for DOS patch, whatever that means. Now the important part is after this, because the remaining space in the two sectors is actually program code. This program code is actually the boot block code. However, only a small portion of it has actually been used. The rest, well, that's left to waste as they're reserved by the file system and are all normally set to zero. However, this time there's something else hidden inside. But why store the Atari ST FAT12 sector inside of the Amiga sector? Well, there's two reasons for this, although the first is less of an issue with the ST than it would have been if this was being used on a PC, but it's still valid. So, here's that disk view again, but this time just the first four tracks. Remember that the inner tracks all have sectors that are 512 bytes in size, whereas track 0 has them at 256 bytes. Following the pattern around the edge, the first sector, shown in pink, should really be around here, which strangely enough is smack bang in the middle of the Amiga's second sector. Timing can be important, but also, all these FAT12 sectors needed to exist for the file system to actually work, and if they hadn't been 256 bytes in size, then there wouldn't have been space for them plus the two Amiga sectors. A very sneaky place to put that extra sector inside space that would normally not be used. But how is that sector able to be even found if it's hidden inside another? Well, this is actually very simple. These disks are MFM encoded. Now I've covered that in another video. And to synchronise with the data from the disk, a special set of codes are used. These codes cannot be generated as a result of the data encoding, and so are inserted as markers to help synchronise and point to the starts of the information. The Amiga uses the 4489 sequence to locate the start of a sector, and straight after this a header is placed. Assuming the header is valid, an Amiga sector is extracted. The way the FAT12 sectors are written to disk is a little bit more complex. First, there's a marker identifying where the header is, and then there's another sequence identifying where the actual data starts. There's also a few other markers, but we'll ignore those for now. As the data comes in from the drive, the operating system will search for these markers and attempt to decode the data. The Amiga will read its sector as expected, but the Atari ST won't recognise it. Instead, it will continue to read through the data until it finds its markers for its data. Very clever. So that explains how data can coexist from two systems on one disk, but it doesn't explain how the file system knows where to look for the files on the disk. Looking at this disk with this flashback, it's interesting to see that the Amiga side shows up as almost a full disk, even though we know that it only occupies half of the physical disk. There's actually only about 347 kilobytes worth of files on there. 
The Atari ST side is using quite a lot of space too. It physically contains 283 kilobytes worth of file data, which doesn't make sense either. There's a possibility that this is just disk flashback reading the capacity wrong, however. But the reason for these differences is actually really clever. Let's start by looking more closely at the FAT12 Atari ST side. The very first sector on the disk contains the boot sector. It also contains the BPB or BIOS parameter block with the following fields. And for this dual format disk, it contains the following information. A note here, it is indeed marked as a single sided disk, with heads or sides being marked as one. The next sectors are fixed into the following pattern, starting with the file allocation table, which I'll come back to in a minute. Then the root directories, and finally the data. Now we're not really actually interested in the data, we know what that will contain, and the root directories is just the directory listing. What I'm actually interested in is the FAT tables. On the left, you can see the number of FATs is 2. This means there's a duplicate copy of it for redundancy on the disk. These tables contain a mapping for every single cluster on the disk. On this disk, one cluster represents two sectors, but I'm not going to go into how that exact mapping works. Now this table can tell you if the cluster is currently unused or is the last cluster within a file, or if it's part of a file by telling you which cluster is the next one in the sequence. Each FAT entry is 12 bits in size, and that's where the name FAT12 comes from. You'll notice that I've left a few gaps in that table. Well, it also describes reserved clusters as well as having a specific code to mark some clusters as bad. Now I wondered if the file system had been set up with some of the sectors marked as reserved or bad initially, just to prevent them being used. Remember that track 40 is still being used by the Amiga. So this file system, FAT12, can't use it. So let's take a look at those FAT sectors on the disk. This is an excerpt of the FAT of that floppy disk. The actual table is a lot larger than this, but the rest is all zero, so this is the only bit we actually need to see. Now don't worry, I know it looks a little daunting, but stay with me. Each set of three digits represents a cluster on the disk, starting from zero. This would be for cluster zero, this one for cluster one, and this one for two, and so on. So if you wanted to find some empty space on the disk to write to, you could simply search for an entry that was zero. The starts of the files are located by looking in the directory tables in sectors 19 to 32 that I mentioned before, but we don't need to look at that. Each entry has a start cluster number where the data is located. Let's take the example of a file whose first cluster is number 3. After all the data has been read from that cluster, the file system looks to this table and finds the record for cluster number 3, and this tells it where the next cluster of data is, in this case cluster number 4. After the data has been read from cluster number 4, the file system looks up the entry for this table at cluster number 4, which tells it the next block of data is in cluster number 5. Finally, after reading cluster number 5, the operating system returns back to this table and finds FFF, meaning this was the last cluster in the file. Now if you take a very careful look at this table, you'll spot these five clusters. And according to our list on the right, these are classed as bad clusters. Now I'll keep this area highlighted and then swap out these numbers for their actual cluster numbers. Why is this important? Well it turns out that the clusters on track 40 are these five, which means as they're marked as bad, they'll never get read from or written to, keeping track 40 perfectly safe for the Amiga file system to use. When I started investigating these disks, I wondered if you had to keep them right protected so you didn't run the risk of damaging the data used by the other file system. Well, at least with the Atari ST side, it looks like you're more or less safe to do that, as long as you don't format the disk, that is. And with that said, let's move on to the Amiga part of the disk. We've already seen that the first two sectors of the Amiga part contained the file system ID, the boot block, and a load of empty space which was being used by the Atari ST side. And that's the only thing the Amiga needs to have on track zero, which is why the rest of the track was dedicated for use by the Atari ST's FAT12 file system. As before, the first sector tells us that this disk is using the original file system or OFS. To read the file system, the root block needs to be located. Regarding terminology and just for now, we'll assume that the word disk block is the same as disk sector, although this isn't always true. Now a standard OFS disk has 11 sectors or blocks per track, 80 tracks per side, and obviously it's double sided. That gives us a total of 1760 blocks. The root block is located right in the middle at block 880. There's a proper way to calculate that, but we don't need to worry about it. 
The root block contains a lot of interesting information, such as the volume label, checksums, and hash tables for looking up file names. But what I'm interested in is this line, the bitmap block pointers. These blocks work a little like the FAT table in the FAT12 file system, except they don't do anything more than mark a block as in use or not. There's one bit in this bitmap for every single block on the disk. If a block bit is set to 1, then the sector is free, i.e. not in use. But if the bit is cleared to 0, then it marks the block as allocated and therefore is in use by something. For example, part of a file or something to do with the directory structure. Taking our disk into account and reading the root block, and then examining this BM pages list, we find that there's actually only one entry populated, and it points to disk block 1177. So, loading that up and decoding it, we get this. And I've set all the used areas to blue and the unused areas to yellow. Now see the two X's at the start instead of ones or zeros? These represent the first two blocks of the drive, i.e. where the boot sector is. And because those two blocks always have to be there, they're not included in this bitmap. Now at a quick glance you can see that there isn't actually much space free. In fact, if you count all the ones, they total 55, each block holding 488 bytes on an OFS disk. Meaning there should be about 26k of disk space free. Well, that's close enough. Given the total of all the files is much less than that, we can assume that the bitmap is being used to mark blocks that shouldn't be written to. Now some of you may have noticed I've arranged the bits in groups of 11 and that's no accident. Remember, there are 11 blocks per track. This means that every other set of 11 bits represents the blocks on the opposite side of the disk. And as the Atari ST is using most of the lower side, it's absolutely no surprise that all of the lower blocks are marked as used. My previous theory now seems more and more likely in that both file systems were prepared empty with all of the unsafe clusters and blocks marked as bad or used, making it fairly easy to add files to the disks without any issues. The only tricky bit would have been track 0, but something like that could easily have been constructed on the Amiga, combining the sectors from both file systems and saving it out. It's obvious that some very careful thought went into creating these disks, and it would have to be someone with detailed knowledge of how both file systems worked. And it's no surprise to me that it was a Rob Northern invention. After all, they were known for the very clever techniques used to create the copy lock copy protection system. Now some of you may have heard of the so-called tri-format disks. These could be read from the PC too, and these were also a Rob Northern invention. I'll need to dig one of those out and see what tricks it used. Anyway, I hope you found this deep dive interesting, and if you did, make sure you give the video a thumbs up. And also, have a think about heading over to my Patreon page to support me in making future content. I want to thank Reese for helping me out with this video, don't forget to check out his channel too. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.